Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulina. Welcome to our Islamic finance podcast, our first episode. So in our first season, we are going to talk a little bit about general view of Islamic economy and finance. So it will be introduction to Islamic finance type of course, but it will talk about some economic issue and finance issues that you would normally expect to learn in uh, in these courses that deal with um, things of that nature. So my name is uh, Almi Cholan. I'll be your host. I'm also joined in this podcast uh, with my daughter, Miriam. She uh, graduated a commerce degree, and um, we did a course before on YouTube, Islamic Finance Clinic, where we talked about certain challenges that face Islamic uh, Islamic finance industry. Salam alaikum, Miriam. How are you? Are you ready for this? Yes. We have our tea and coffee. I'm drinking coffee, she's drinking tea and some water. So join us, we can have a simultaneous sip as, as we start. <laughs> Bismillah. That's beautiful. Coffee and tea, they, they make all of these podcasts work much better for the listeners and uh, for us as well. So this podcast... We want to examine some of the ideas that are impacting our economy and finance. And one of the first things, when whenever you think about these topics, is that where do these principles come from? Like when you think about people talk about money, economy, these days there is a lot of discussion. What sort of economic system should we have? There is a lot of criticism of capitalism that doesn't work, or there is inequality, there is greediness, there is all of these systemic problems. And then people... Uh, might propose let's do something that is radically different like go towards socialism or whatever whatever other derivative of 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 this system and uh, uh, and then you might find people especially muslim muslims asking themselves so what does islam have to say about any of these ideologies or economic systems muslim might read something in islamic book where, for instance, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prohibited uh, market manipulation in terms of uh, fixing the prices. And uh, he, he left basically that people negotiate the prices between themselves. So if somebody is reading that and he reads Adam Smith, he will say, we well, see Islam is very much free market economy and um, capitalism and all of that. And they will find many of these whether it's Ibn Haldun Muqaddima references and other verses, uh, freedom to contract, freedom to engage. So they'll find a lot of evidences to say and suggest Islam is very much like a capitalism. On the other hand, somebody might read some other verses and they say, okay, but look on the other side, zakat, for example, uh, which is the tax, type of a tax, not really tax, but what they translated as a poor due or a charity or something like that, which is taken from the wealth of the rich. It's not like an income tax. It's more like uh, on your wealth that is, let's say, not active. The difference here is that zakat is someone's right in your money. So it's, uh, let's say, 2.5% on, on the cash and cash equivalent. Then people will say, look, Islam is very much towards socialism because it taxes the rich, takes from the rich and gives to the poor people. And then you also see some other instruments like sadaqah and general spirit of uh, generosity and giving. And then the people make up argument that Islam is very nice because it treats people nicely, because people associate taking from somebody money and giving it to others as being nice. So this sort of simplistic way of thinking about the problems uh, leads people to discount overall objectives of socialism or capitalism, and uh, and uh, and they really treat Islam very unfairly in this discussion. So Islam, as an ideology, as a system, as a, as a set of belief, way of living life, comes with its own objectives, aims. Like Sharia itself has its own aims, and they differ what it wants to see in terms of economy and how this wealth is being created or distributed, it comes down to specific rules that govern the system and what it's trying to achieve, which is completely different from any other system. 
And more you study these other systems, you see that the way they operate or think is very much driven what is at the root of the beliefs of the people who build this system or who design or who navigate. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, you do. You come across people who have the belief of, you know, socialism and you come across a lot of people who study economics who are more favoring towards capitalism. Yeah. What you see is that whenever we analyze why we hold certain beliefs, what are the causes and effects of implementing any economic system, usually people are not trained or they are not thinking deeply, especially in this upside-down world. Mm -hmm. So what does Islamic Islam in general stand for? We said that Islamic Sharia wants to protect integrity of economic system. One of the aims or maqasid of Sharia is protection of wealth. So on the individual level, you talk about uh, certain, let's say, transactions, the way you enter into the contract, the way you acquire wealth, uh, that you cannot cheat, that you have to uh, freely engage in transaction. At the same time, when it comes to system, to the state, Islam does prescribe how we protect that economy and financial system and preserve its integrity. So corner store of this is built on the trust and putting things in order and removing any sort of injustice. So three particular uh, concepts that um, probably are important to introduce, and you can find more about this in uh, IOFI's Code of Ethics for Islamic Finance Professionals. For a couple of years, uh, we had a group at IOFI. I was uh, very fortunate to be a part of that working group that worked together on this uh, Code of, of Ethics for Islamic Finance Professionals. And some of the core elements in this that were identified, and there are many, many more, but like uh, number one is Adal, or in Turkish as they say Adalet, and anybody watching Ertuğrul, they know Adalet and Hurriyet. <laughs> These are concepts every, every Ertuğrul fan knows. Adalet justice, which is very, very interesting when you look at the, the word, it basically means to put something in its rightful place, where it belongs, where it should be, in the right spot. So what would be then the opposite? Take something out of its rightful spot. Yeah, so this is what we call a second concept. It's it's a zulum or, or sometimes in Bosnian, I think in other call it zulum. So zulum or zulum is a absence of that uh, adal. It's oppression. That's right. So that's why even if you look at the disbelief kufur, it is a part of injustice. And because you you are doing injustice to yourself because you are misplacing something which is your part of your ibadah and worship part of how you understand your relationship when it comes to God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So denying that, meaning taking something that a right of Allah to be worshipped and so on, you're misplacing that. And then you have a concept of uh, amana. So amana is uh, trust, honoring and fulfilling duties, powers, responsibility associated with uh, one's role, rank, position, and any status that is entrusted. When I study these many rules that Islam has in terms of uh, economy and finance, I gain over the time a lot of confidence that Islam has very sophisticated and uh, deep principles and rules that can deal with every situation that we have today. And I, I don't see that in any other uh, religion or a system. Hmm? Yeah. Like, for example, if, if, if we go now and we think about uh, what other followers of any other religion in this number uh, would um, consider their rules, what is prohibited, what is halal, what is mm -hmm. when they are choosing anything. Yeah, you yeah know. there isn't any. They would even explore the concept. Exactly. Of course, you have some religious like kosher food, let's say. Judaism, mm -hmm. you have certain maybe dress code, and uh, mm -hmm. so there are some some things. Uh, maybe if somebody is vegan, they might not uh, eat certain things, or if somebody is, uh, I don't know what the ideology is, environmentalist or something, they might have how they invest money and don't invest in fossil fuel or something something else. But uh, the comprehensive life lifestyle from the morning to the evening, like a holistic approach. Exactly. And that's, I, I guess, this is why I wanted to have these kind of podcasts, maybe a bit more long-term format other than usually YouTube videos, so that uh, I, can, um, I can share some of the observation, 
Um, we can maybe tackle some of the questions and, and see some of the questions, what Islam has to offer in, in today's discussion. All right, so if I look at, for instance, just the normal definitions of economy, mm-hmm. you see the Oxford, for example, uh, Learner's Dictionary says it's a relationship between production, trade, and supply of money in the particular country or region. Yeah. When it comes to the production and trade, we have a statement that the Prophet ﷺ was asked what form of a gain is the best. And he وسلم, said, a man's work with his hands and every legitimate sale. Usually in the past, people would talk about what does that mean, somebody work with their own hands and every legitimate sale. Scholars would discuss whether this is manufacturing or agriculture, what has higher status. Usually discussion revolves around whatever benefits people the most. And What we see in all of these things is that it is something at the end that is tangible that people use. So today that could be anything else. Now, when it comes to the producing something and then selling that, that's how you put these things into economy. So you produce something that people hopefully will desire, want, and then you you, you sell that in the market and that's how people end up using it. Market is the place where ownership is passed. So this is cycle of entrepreneurship, business, and trade. Then there is a third here, a bit which is about supply of money. Now, when it comes to supply of money and how the money enter into this market, Islam here would fundamentally differ from any other system that is operating currently. Not that in Judaism and Christianity, they might have some issues around riba, but how many today Christians would you find that even know that the um, Bible would have a verse that prohibits interest on food and on the money. These are very important two categories, food and money. Why particularly on these things? Because our rules on riba affect these categories, edible, staple foods, and the money. Usually people don't think about the depth of why Islam does not allow certain transactions with, the, let's say, food. We know about money and we'll talk about money, but like food. Especially these days when uh, the small increase in price of food, which when you use it as a, the money is used, would affect people being able to buy food. Maybe some people, if you ask them if the food jump 0.01%, maybe they cannot eat three times a day in that day rice, which is staple food or something like that. Mm-hmm. For us, maybe in Australia, we don't even know the price of rice. It doesn't bother us. Uh, But for many people, if you start mistreating food, there could be huge consequences in society. So Islam puts specific rules. You see, even just around the food, how to exchange different types of food. So we see that um, this supply of money and how the money enter into this production differs because Islam doesn't want to have then separate economy, financial economy, where this money works by itself and goes in circles and, and, and grows. And if you ask them, but hang on a minute, this this now money giving birth and just growing in its own from itself, it, it's not any more natural. It's not it's not connected with the economy. Where in Islam we we would force the money to be connected. We wouldn't uh, allow it to become a commodity that is sold. When it comes to the economics, we could say that um, is the study of the use of these resources scarce resources, limited resources that have alternative use. The way we make these choices, it's what really economics is uh, all about. When it comes to finance, it's, it does a little bit differ from economics because ac- finance is more specific subset, mm-hmm. which uh, is more associated with, uh, with money and the transactions dealing with money, credit, banking, investment, money management, things of that nature. You know, But in Islamic finance, finance is not just purely, uh, like you see, financial intermediation. It has to be connected with something real. And we'll talk much more about it uh, in our next uh, episodes. So when you think about how we said about economy, choices, scarcity, there is this idea that when you have a scarcity, it... It is something that brings uncertainty. Is there something you think today uh, people are most or very uncertain about? Is there something that you notice, let's say, in your generation or other people? I think that there is a concern for like jobs and the future and stuff. But I think the biggest concern is politically where we're going and how that's going to impact our jobs and our futures. 
these kind of factors in society, whether economic or political, obviously they all in- intersect in the bigger in bigger picture. And y- you're right, this, this is a struggle that goes back to the beginning of the human existence. In fact, when Allah created the first man and woman, the devil, Iblis, approach these newly created beings with the, with the following propositions. And if you read in Quran, your Lord, it says, your Lord did not forbid you these three, except that you become angels or become of the immortal. And so you see, uh, devil approach our grandparents with this idea, promise, that is more like an insurance policy, peace of mind. When he said to them, your Lord did not forbid you this trick, except that you become angels or become of the immortals. So he is telling them that there is something uh, that if you consume, you will live like angels, immortal and free from these limitations that you have now. He is obviously understanding their nature. He is playing with this idea of uncertainty in their mind. And then he swore to them, says, indeed, I am to you from the sincere advisors. So in this interplay between desire for certainty and, and certain fears that surround it, like we, we, we feel that today people have that uncertainty. The life itself is uncertain. It's a test. And Allah says that we will surely test you with something of fear and hunger and a loss of wealth and lives and fruits, but give glad tidings to the patient. The life carries certain tests, and we are tested. Fear, hunger, a loss of wealth, lives, and fruit. Fruit of what we, sometimes from a business, from the profit, from our, and, and uh, things like that. And then in another verse it says uh, that we will surely test you until we make evident those who strive amongst you, and the patient, and we will test your affairs. So we see that this life and the test conditions that are presented to us. Ibn Kathir talks about this uh, uh, and, and says that Allah tests us sometimes with bounty, meaning of having something, and sometimes with affliction of fear and hunger. So you see, these are two sets of conditions. So when you think about life, you either have something, you are like surplus, or you don't have something. So this shows that the decisions are tested under these two sets of conditions and this bounty of having something or affliction of not having. Fear can equally impact everyone from these two categories as we all face that uncertain future because for somebody with surplus, they fear that they may lose what they have. And those who don't have it already, they fear that they might not find it. The scarcity is really reality. And one of the economists says what good definition of the scarcity is that um, what everybody wants adds up to more than that there is. So this is a reality. There, is, uh, there has never been enough to satisfy everybody completely. That is, that is the real constraint, the reality of this life, that there is not enough of everything for everybody to satisfy everything. And that's just not only in money, that could be in any resource, any blessings, anything. So the, there is a consequences of this is that to deal with this uncertainty, we've developed numerous areas of study to understand and reach objectives that we uh, seek. So this conflict uh, and test within this uh, life arises when our hopes, dreams, and aspirations are met with ethical and other norms that stand on our way. So the human when they have that desire for certainty and they reach for that, let's say, wealth or resources or any outcome, what they are confronted with is uh, some sort of dilemma, ethical dilemma, moral dilemma. And when we say ethical, moral, all these dilemmas, for us as a Muslim, the Islam is the source of these ethics and these rules. So when we talk about Islamic economy and finance, what we are talking about, we are examining ideas that impact our economy and system on the basis of these values. I would just finish with the story of our upside-down world. And that is the story of a kingdom a long time ago. People used to live in that kingdom. There was a king. He had these ministers. One day, one of the ministers, he didn't listen to the king. So king decided to chop off his nose. This is just a story. No? 
So now this minister going around, he doesn't have a nose. Uh, everybody's laughing at him. He comes to the king and he says, my dear king, I can't do my job anymore. Whenever I go, these ministers are laughing at me. I can't, can't do it anymore. I can't handle it. The king calls these ministers to his office and he said, why are you laughing at him? And he ordered that everyone knows be cut off from these ministers. So now ministers lose their noses. They go into the town. They start doing the business. People laugh at them. They come after a while to the king and say, oh, dear king, we can't do our job. Whenever we go to the town, people see us without nose and they start laughing at us. So then the king decides to cut nose of everybody in the in that in that kingdom. And um, as soon as the new baby is born, the, the, the nose is chopped off and that's, that goes for some time. The new king is now born. It become a tradition. The new king nose is cut off. So this goes for several generations. Become habit in the society becomes the way normal way after some time one young man from another kingdom comes into that kingdom on the way he passed through the market and then as he passed as he tried to buy something in the market he looks around something is strange and he's looking like what's wrong with these people where are they noses who did this as he looks at them other people look at him so strangely they are astonished and then suddenly they start laughing they're laughing at him and making jokes. Look at this man. He has a nose. Why didn't they? Didn't his parents know that they should cut off his nose when the child is born? And they're laughing at him. He's looking at them, no noses. He's also laughing at them. So they laugh at each other. And so in this story, you see something that is normal becomes not normal anymore. And something that is not normal becomes normal. And that is what we said in the beginning, the difference between justice and injustice. So the justice is that you put things in its right place. And, and injustice is you put things in the wrong place. But society can sometimes accept the wrong thing as the right thing as well. Today, when we look at economy, business, how things are produced, how the business is going, who is in this business community. Anything you look at, you see half of the things are fake. Even the food you eat, it's not, it's not real. You have 100 ingredients, you don't know what's in the food. So now we have everything upside down. And if we want to fix this, brings the justice, put everything in its place, that will require people, believers, people of integrity, to get up and engage in that economy. And um, unfortunately, uh, we have been missing from the scene. We are not contributing. Most of what we consume as Muslims is not produced by us. The other day I was uh, watching some news and one of these um, big fashion brands, forgot what's Tommy Hill. Uh, Tommy Hill figure. Something like that, I think. There was a big news, they made the new hijab. And they said, this is going to be new hijab, special material. And I was thinking, like, how special, what, <laughs> what they need to design to make hijab so special, you know? Yeah. How difficult it is to make these things? Unfortunately, most of what is going as a part of halal economy is not produced by Muslims, unfortunately. And I think this is where the main problem is. I think it's a great that a lot more people from everywhere participate in halal. But the main consumers of that halal are not participating as producers. So I think if we want to put our Islam in the way of life, then we need to be much more involved in production side of things. People don't need just another thing that we already have, another junk food, another uh, fashion label that is totally not related to modesty, even if the modesty label or something like that. No, we need something that will really show our way of life, that will embed certain values into these products. So I think it's a time for new generation of people and Islamic economy really to rise and create alternative, alternative thinking in terms of economy and also alternative products and services. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. So, um... We're talking about how, like, we want to bring in, like, a new way of thinking and dealing with 
everything in the economic system and you know just bringing in morals and ethics but how how would you bring that change how would you bring about that change in thinking and that change in everything if you're the only one doing it do you know what i mean like mm. how can it be that you know you, okay let's say i want to engage in okay the fashion industry i want to engage in this market in an ethical wholesome manner and yes you know now slow fashion is a thing but how would you engage with it with islamic proper islamic principles when you're the only one doing it obviously starting something is a challenge when you think about anything that we are using today at one point in time started as very minor blip on the screen you look at um, i think 20 years ago when alibaba started uh, that changed chinese let's say e-commerce it was a teacher who started little project and then it became hundreds of billion dollar worth of e-commerce payment network and so on if you look at the facebook guy started in his uh, room a little website netflix same thing a little concept that uh, is now mass having hundreds of millions of users so all of the ideas they start small to do it there needs to be some persistence there needs to be something that um, you're doing it for a reason there is a commitment so if we talk about let's say fashion for example uh, first we need to start by thinking about where do we fit in the overall for instance let's say f- since you break uh, bro that a point on the fashion most of the fashion now even is let's say let's say all of the fashion now what do you think they are trying to sell to us what's their product what's their thing how they selling it to us what's their selling point mm. I feel like it's a lifestyle and yeah all right so what sort of usually lifestyle what's the, the common denominator in all of these lifestyle well for the most part it's immoral sort of lifestyle or right yeah so so they are kind of following their desires mm. so they would show something in the dress that will awaken desires in people and this is the lowest of the desires so they would a uh, follow they would either uh, look at human beings in terms of these impulses and um, and an emotion that they associated often the lifestyle uh, it wouldn't be necessarily moral especially with the new ideologies it would cross between not moral lifestyle to unnatural lifestyle as well yeah but when you think about then what would be islamic thing that, that is different in these brands How, what 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 would be islamic is it just is it just the length of the clothes or would be more normal more natural i think more something that is like it's appealing but it doesn't have that element of like awakening desires or like uh, attachment for example to things or wanting more of something by having that dress <laughs> so that means that rather than appealing to the lowest desires with the fashion your fashion would be more appealing to dignify the human being so the way that human is dressed would more be in a way that that we highlight human aspect so when you look at certain people let's say in the west now we live in a let's say australia and let's say queen is coming the 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 way that she would be dressed by people the way that she would carry herself it's designed with more to show that dignity even in the terms of the manners you wouldn't be able to just shake hands with the queen for example you it would be against the protocol the queen shake hands with somebody by offering for example the the way that she is maybe walking the way that she is eating or when to speak so all of this protocol there is a certain wisdom and the logic uh, what is trying to preserve so there is a whole lifestyle of islam that would be embedded in this clothes so the clothes itself then uh, would try to fit within that kind of a lifestyle where it honors the per- person and dignifies that person 
and uh, therefore the design the style the everything would be appropriate and and when you see that person you 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 can you can see that this is a decent person you you think this is honorable person this is not the person of of all of those other things yeah. if you had that idea for example and the same could be said for any industry then the path would be to sort of raise awareness put a story out find and connect with the people who are similar who share that identity and idea it's important to be brave to take the risk grow it slowly step by step and and perfect and learn and understand and do the all the things that that makes sense that's basically how it goes and look some people will that, that will be my maybe small business and there will be some people that Allah bless that they make a huge business of that huge brand that we can be proud of but unless you try unless you do you you don't know where you are uh, some people maybe they don't have an entrepreneurial but they might be great at supporting those with that vision and uh, skill set uh, i think you either lead have a vision have a confidence believe in that or you help somebody who is leading so you are part of that uh, uh, making the difference much of it is in the belief because even these other people with their confidence how they sell it they convince these gullible people this is the fashion uh, I, i don't want to even mention some of these idea that we see uh, terrible terrible nothing to do with fashion It's pure demonic uh, yeah, way of thinking sometimes you see okay like uh, there's a particular brand that i know of it started on the right path but then as the years go on and and they they acquire that you know that customer base let's call it then they start changing and then they start changing to a, to suit a different customer base and they lose their initial customer base but they gain a much bigger customer base and then again they're like okay we're making more profit but they're selling their values so like how do you make sure that you stay within what you wanted to do initially and you don't i guess sell your values because you're the little guy in this case mm. you're the little guy how do you not sell your values mm. when you become when you come to that competitive market and you're you don't have the ability exactly and you don't have the force of the market behind you uh, when it comes to the uh, brand or business starting from one place and then uh, changing this comes to the beginning of our discussion that people are tested under two different set of conditions if you remember mm-hmm. by either having something and then they fear that they will lose it or by not having something So these are two different tests. So somebody who is starting they they might put their trust in Allah and they say Allah I want to do this and that and then they are hopeful and then they succeed. So they pass that test. But then when they succeed just like our grandparents in paradise you see there is no scarcity in paradise. How little scarcity did our grandparents face in paradise? Adam and his wife. How much when iblis said to them if you don't do this if you don't eat this that's it you will not be like angels so they have everything they succeeded they have everything except that one that little thing so now you have something you fear of losing so this is the human weakness so person builds the business and then shaitan comes to him and said well if you don't do this 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 change your brand to something to have more people more money they you will not be accepted yeah uh maybe you will lose not just money maybe status now now you are status you need to show these different people that you are something so the shaitan comes from that angle that you will lose something that doesn't always necessarily mean the money although it could mean money it could be that you will lose standing in society so these are the two forces that impact human being wealth and status and so uh while the person was successfully passing not having something patient with not having being grateful being appreciative and trusting allah when they have something is a different story and that's something that we see not just in this area i remember one of the scholar in uh, in serbia part of serbia sanjak where muslims live mufti zukorlic he was the talking giving a story with when people would give zakat and uh, in that region muslims 
forgot their religion after the Second World War and communism came. And so he went to study, came back just around the war time in Balkan, about 90s, he became Mufti. And he started to resurrect the idea of paying zakat. He tell a story of the rich businessman bringing first time zakat and he's struggling with himself to put that money. You can imagine, his heart doesn't want to let go of that money, but he eventually found a way to put that money. Next year, he was still having a difficulty to give zakat, but he eventually put it down. The third year, he mastered that in himself, that fear. And he came with the money and without any uh, difficulty, he put the zakat. He gave that charity. And you see that somebody struggling and then overcoming that, which is a different from another person who, when he didn't have much money, he, let's say, he's got $5,000. And then people say to him, give zakat from that. He says, what am I going to give zakat? I have only little money. It's easy for those rich people to give money because they have a lot of it. But me, for me to give this much, it's, it's a lot. So when he became rich, people come to him and say, now, now you have a, a lot of money. Give zakat. Million, you become millionaire. He says, what are you talking about? I'm rich. You know how big my zakat is? It's easy for the little guy. His zakat is little bit. He can easily give it. But for me, two and a half percent is a lot of money. <laughs> I'm rich now. <laughs> so you see, the point is that he didn't want to do it. He didn't want to do it, but you sometimes cannot see it immediately. But this is also uh, connected with intention of the person. So when we build these kind of businesses or anything, we need to start with the right intention. That we are the Muslims, we have a lifestyle that we want to protect and preserve. Whether it's a fashion, education, psychology, technology, banking, investment, anything you can think of. Our intention must be to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to do something that is halal, to find the barakah in money, that is the concept that is lost, to, to feed ourselves from that, to help society in a wholesome way. If we do that, then inshallah Allah will uh, bless our business and support us, and we should always check ourselves, be in the company of the right people. Sometimes even as these people progress on the higher level, they surround themselves with the people who eventually take them to the area that this become inevitable. So we should always surround ourselves with the right people, do the right thing, connect with the community, balance life. And we hope Allah, inshallah, protects us because at the end of the day, this is where the real guidance is. If we are left to our own selves, there is no hope for us then. So that's it for today. Thank you all for listening. If you look in the show notes, you'll find the link for our website, islamicfinancepodcast.com with all of the social media links, which are all new from YouTube channel, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Follow us, share this information with those who you think might benefit. Join also our email list on the website. And inshallah, we'll see you next week for the new episode. Thank you very much from both of us. Assalamu alaikum.